units in the AP Calculus exam. We have so far covered three of them. Today we're going to look at unit four. Unit four is position velocity acceleration as well as related rates. So we're going to do the first half, which is position velocity acceleration, take a mini break, and then pick up and do the second half. Unit 4 is anywhere from 10 to 15% of the AP exam. So this is typically where you have a free response with like a rate in and a rate out. So, or you're going to have your find the velocity, find the acceleration. Is it speeding up? Is it slowing down? I feel like this is the unit where the questions are sneakily added. So the first part is going to be interpreting the meaning. So can we identify what the units are? The second part is straight line motion. And another part is tangent lines with linearization and linear approximation. So for interpreting the meaning of the derivative, this is the part where you need to be able to give a noun, a unit, and a time. So they use the acronym NUT. When is it changing? What is changing? And what are the units involved? So you always want to be able to tell me when, what, and the units. So the when is always at the particular time. This is when you want to say at the instant x equals, you know, five minutes. This is where you really want to be specific in what you are discussing. So it says the function f of a models the time in minutes for a chemical reaction to occur as a function of the amount a of a catalyst used, measured in milliliters. What are the units for F double prime A. So go ahead and read example one and two and pick your choices. All right. So it's actually going to be the flip of that. It's C. Because they made it that F of A is in time. So that means that if you would take that derivative of that, the change is in the milliliters where the time is like the constant. So it's kind of like saying position is given in miles. Does that make sense? I, that's why I picked this one because I was like, oh, it's like everybody's going to be like, yeah, it's deep. It's always, it's always changing amount over time over time. And they like set it up that it was not. Okay, and then number two. I think it's C from what I remember typing yesterday because in the big, the only difference, yeah, the only difference from C and D 
is that it says um, at five hours after it opens is the same, and then the units are um, different. It's the factory is producing turnover rate of 300 pieces per hour, five hours after it opens. Hour two. I'm with you. D's a little iffy. Like the reason it's on A and B are easy because it's during its fifth and in the fifth. Where is it? The only thing I can think is that you don't know. Like it says that producing chocolate is increasing. And we don't necessarily know that it's well, even though if it's, it's positive. Yeah. I know, but that's the only thing I'm thinking is what's holding them back. If a function f is differentiable at the point a, f of a, then the equation for the tangent line can be made and can be written. This is linear approximation. So this is where we have like L of x equals the f of a plus f prime of a at x minus a. So linear approximation is basically saying, okay, I want to approximate a point using derivatives and mostly without calculators. So it's just that L of X equals F of A plus F prime of A at X minus A. And I don't think I ever actually wrote the equation down for you. So the one thing that is important is concavity with linearization. So I believe everything in green you have to fill in. Um, if a function is concave down, then the graph of the tangent line will always be below it, or the original function will always be below the graph of the tangent line, rather. Therefore, the tangent line is always going to be an over-approximation. So if your graph is concave down, then the approximation is always an overestimate. We know that if the graph is concave down, that would come from the second derivative being negative. So if you don't know maybe the equation or the function, then you would want to investigate if the second derivative is positive or negative. Conversely, if the graph is concave up, then it will always lie above. Therefore, the linear approximation is always an underestimate. So the original graph will always be above the linear approximation, therefore making my approximation an underestimate. And you can kind of see that from the graph, where here's the graph of the curve, here's your tangent line, and the tangent line is always below it. So essentially, when we are doing linearization, what we are doing is finding an equation of a tangent line and using that to predict a point. So in the case of this problem, it said you are given f of 3 equals negative 8. We want to approximate 3.3 using the tangent line to the graph at x equals 3. So the table gives the derivative values. So what that means is f prime of 3 is 2.4. So that's the slope we're going to use. You're going to plug in 3 and negative 8 for x1 and y1. And then you would plug in 3.3 .3 for x and solve for y. So I'd have y minus a minus 8 equals f prime of 3, x minus 3. Plug in the 2.4, plug in the 3.3. .3. So 3.3 .3 minus 3 is 0.3. Yeah, and this one is calculator friendly, so you could just type that all in. And the reason... Yep, and the reason... Um, this one is calculator um, friendly 
is because there's no function. So it's not like you can cheat and like get like the actual answer off your calculator. Oh, instead of subtracting yeah, your eight. Really okay, and then example two, it says let h be a differentiable function such that h of five equals four and h prime of five equals negative one fourth. The graph of h is concave up on an interval five seven. So they told me it's concave up. Exactly. So like the minute you know it's concave up, you're automatically able to eliminate A, or sorry, B and D. And then at that point, you would use your calculator and calculate um, Y minus 7 equals negative 1 fourth. 5.2 minus 5. Okay. That's what I have. Yeah. So you get A. 5.2 is approximately 3.95. And my approximation is an underestimate because it is below the concave curve. All right. So then that leads to PVA, so position, velocity, acceleration. Position is usually measured in units of length. Velocity is usually measured in length with respect to change in time. Velocity is always the derivative of position. Acceleration is the derivative of velocity. It's the second derivative of position, and it's usually measured in the units of velocity over another unit of time. So calculator question, a particle's position along the x-axis in meters is given by x of t equals 12 sine pi 6 t plus 5 from 0 to 10, where t is measured in seconds. Find the particle's velocity at t equals 6. It is. So, you, uh, so I was gonna say, like, you can just kind of look at it. So, velocity is the derivative, so it's 12 cosine pi 6 t times pi 6, and then um, plus 5, where that 5 becomes a 0. So, v of 6 is really nice in this case because you get pi over 6 times 6, which just becomes pi. So that just becomes the cosine of pi. And again, you're dividing by 6 and multiplying by pi. So 12 divided by 6 became a 2. Cosine of pi becomes negative 1. So negative 1 times 2 times pi 
is negative 2 pi. So if the velocity is negative, what direction is the particle traveling? If the velocity is negative, what direction is the particle traveling? Yeah. So if I were to if I were to ask you to tell me like what is happening with this particle, we would say at t equals six seconds, the particle is moving. You could say backwards or left because we don't know like what technical direction it's going. So you could say backwards or left. at a rate of 2 pi meters per second. I don't need to put the negative on the 2 pi this time because I said it was moving backwards. The rate is the velocity at 6 seconds. So that t equals 6 is the time when it's changing. The units are meters per second. And what is changing is the particle's position. What if I did put like the negative on x to y and see what they draw from that? I think it's going to totally just depend on the grader and how picky they are. Like some might, some might not. And that's what makes the AP exam so difficult. When do you know? I always like get confused like on when it's moving away from the origin. So I actually would not know if this is moving toward or away from the origin without looking at its position. Okay. So if I wanted to know that, I would need to know x of 6. So x of 6 in this case, sine of pi over 6 is 0. So that's 0. Or, well, sine of pi, rather, is 0, so that's 0, so then it's 5. So x of 6 is equal to 5. So because the particle is 5 units to the right of the origin, but now it's moving backwards, it is moving towards, it is moving towards the origin. But if exactly. It was, if x of 6 was like negative 5, that would be away. Exactly. Yep. So in this case, the particle is moving towards the origin. Yep. So when is an object at rest? An object is at rest when velocity is zero. It is moving to the left or down when velocity is negative, and it is moving right or up when velocity is greater than zero. And then the last little bit with position velocity acceleration is our A rock, I rock. A rock is average velocity. So I know that once we got into integrals, it started to become like iffy as to whether we were integrating or deriving. So if you read average velocity, then it's the change in position over change in time. Average velocity implies slope of the secant. Average velocity implies slope of the secant. instantaneous velocity is the derivative at a particular time. So in that last example, we found the instantaneous velocity at time t equals 6. We only knew what the particle was doing at that particular moment in time. And then speed Speed is the absolute value of velocity. I totally missed a parenthesis in there. So it is the absolute value of velocity. It is the absolute value of the rate of change. So it's dx dt.
speeding up and slowing down. This is the concept in which you see speed and you're like, yeah, absolute value of velocity. And it's like, no, you just said speeding up and slowing down, but really it's the sign of the velocity and the sign of the acceleration. If velocity and acceleration are in opposite directions, meaning one is positive and one is negative, then what's happening is they're opposing each other. Therefore, the object is slowing down. So if the object's velocity and acceleration are moving together, then it is speeding up. So when the object is moving in the right direction or upwards, then velocity is positive and it is also having a positive acceleration. We can see that in this graph. So from zero to two, velocity is positive because it's above. Acceleration is negative because the line is decreasing. Therefore, the slope is negative. Therefore, velocity is positive, acceleration is negative, the object is slowing down. From two to four, both are negative, therefore the object is speeding up. From four to six, velocity is negative, acceleration is now positive, slowing down. And six to eight, positive, positive, speeding up. <laughs> So we're gonna like do a quick like FRQ and then I have related rate notes. Yep, so we're gonna do like the free response problem. So do you wanna try? Hell no. Why? If it's still raining, I'm sitting in a locker room. Uh, start to talk through it. I know. Just let's go through A and B. And then we'll go talk through C while you do C. All right. So anytime I see a problem like this, the first thing I do is label my graph. So like the first thing I did when I read that was, okay, the areas of the region are eight, three, and two. So I'm gonna fill in that eight, three, and two. I'm also going to write down um, the initial condition. So I'm told at X of zero. Oh, no, I didn't the particle is negative two. Yeah, so that's my initial condition. No, I'm redoing it right now, hold on. So, I just like to put everything I know, and then again, they tell me velocity is zero at zero, three, and five. So, that is also hinting at that the particle is at rest, which means it's probably changing direction, and we know it did change direction because it goes from negative to positive, positive to negative at three and five. So it says find both the time and the position of the particle when the particle is farthest to the left. Justify your answer. So this is a lot like the problem we just looked at. So we know x of zero equals negative two. Then you want to take into account the next zero. Well, that's at three. So x of three 
is negative 2 minus 8. Because the velocity is negative, it goes backwards 8 more units. Therefore, the position of the particle at 3 is negative 10. At 5, it's now moved forward, so it's negative 10 plus 3, so negative 7. And then at its final position of 6, it's negative 7 minus 2, which is negative 9. So it says, when is the particle farthest to the left? Justify your answer. So this is a fundamental theorem of calc problem in a way. So it's farthest to the left. Yes. I have a question on part D, just wording. Okay. Oh, let me get, get there. Yeah. Oh. So in this case, it is farthest to the left at three. three. Yes. times of t, where 0 to 6 is the particle at x equals negative 8. Three. So, um, exactly, because basically the particle is transitioning, and what I did was I kind of just like used the graph up here, and I like plotted my points real quick. So I was like, oh, it's at negative 2. And then I was like, okay, at 3, it's at negative 10. So negative 2, negative 10, and then I said it was at um, negative 7 and then negative 9. So what that means is that it crosses 1, 2, 3 times. So I sort of just drew it on a graph and looked at it that way. Or you could say by the intermediate value theorem, x equals t. The intermediate value theorem x of t equals negative 8 three times. Did I have to put i, b, t? No, it's just like if. I just said that it had to cross when going from negative 10 to negative yeah. 7. And that's what I was going to say. Like, I would have given each instance. That's what I did. Yeah. Part C. On the interval 2 to 3 is the speed of the particle increasing or decreasing. Give a reason for your answer. Okay, so what do you say? Decreasing is velocity is negative, and acceleration is positive. Okay, so you exactly, you want to go to two and three, and we say, okay, velocity is negative, however, the function is increasing, therefore, it is decreasing. It says is the speed of the particle. Yeah. So yeah, I would reflect this. So I would just have to be careful that when I talk about speed, the speed scalar. It's the absolute value of that, but the velocity is now positive, but the acceleration is it's negative. Amazing. So it's just that you have to flip your reasoning, because down here. So it's still decreasing because v of t oh, well, my reasoning was is greater than zero and a of t is less than zero. My well, reasoning was know. velocity and acceleration have different signs. That's fine. Actually, I put times, but it's meant to be signs. Okay. 
See? You said you have a question on D. Yeah. Okay. So during what time intervals, if any, is the accelerator to the particle negative? Justify your answer. So I put when velocity is decreasing. Is Correct. decreasing the right word? That's what I said. Yep, I said the acceleration is negative when the velocity is decreasing. Velocity is decreasing from 0 to 1, 4 to 6. So that sums up the PDA part of the unit four. We're going to look at related rates next. On there, I kind of gave you like a cheat sheet page in the middle of your notes that has like all the different terminology that go with this. So that terminology is just an easy way of summarizing. Yeah, that page right there. So I have two cheat sheets for you today. I have that cheat sheet and I have a all the rules you need to know cheat sheet. So did Corey just wake up, text you, he was going back to sleep and then go back to sleep? No, he texted me in order to tell me that he needs a ride. However, his sister was being locked out. That's why I don't need to know his rule. And he did not come out. And I just asked Kelsey, I'm like, Kelsey, where's Corey? And he and she's like, well. He didn't have the best night's sleep last night. So he, he is such a little girl. girl. He is a pain. You need them stapled in order. I told everyone how well tested yesterday at the meet. All right, so in this unit, we also look at related rates. Related rates are essentially chain rule problems where we have <clears throat> respect to time as opposed to respect to a variable. Oftentimes on the AP exam, these are gonna be a triangle problem. These are going to be your Pythagorean theorem problems, or these are gonna be a volume problem. The nice thing is AP does not make you memorize the volume formulas. They will give them to you. What they would not give you, though, is your Pythagorean theorem or if it's a similar triangle. And the similar triangles were like the shadow problems that we all hated. So I have two of those examples in today's notes. And then I also have like one or two volumes of shape problems. These are also like our train problems. And I feel like a lot of times they'll give you the train problem, but they make like multiple related rates with it. So it'd be like train A is going this way, train B is going this way. How far apart are train A and B at this time? What happens What happens if da-da-da changes? So, or they'll ask you about like parts of the train, like what's their acceleration? So it goes back to the PVA we just talked about. So in this example, we have two similar triangles. We are given that dx dt is 3, so you're given the rate of change of the small side. And we want to find dy dt. And then we're given that x is 15 and 6 and y and like kind of their relationship. So you have like the small triangle 6y here inside the big triangle, which is 15 W. So what we have to do is set up a related um, similarity statement using those two triangles. Yes. Yeah. Everywhere. No, everywhere. Yes. So here's the problem though with using W. There's no X in there. There's no X in there, yeah, exactly. X plus Y. Yes. So the W is almost like... Stupid. Yes. Yeah. We'll call it the 40. So now, what do you do when you have a proportion set up like this? Cross multiply. Okay. And then we'll take the direct Yeah. 
So at that point, then you would want to just like cross multiply, combine like terms. So you'd have 15y equals 6x plus 6y. So I would subtract over the 6y. And you get 6x equals. So dy dx dx dy. What? I'm sorry. No. You have 6x equals 9y. Yeah. And then you take your derivative now. 6 equals 9. So you have 6, dt. yeah, dx dt equals 9 dy dt. And you're solving for dy dt because we know dx dt is 3. So you have 6 times 3 divided by 9. So you get 18 over 9. And what would my units be? Feet per second. So yeah. Are you confused whenever we actually do like the DX DT? I mean, whenever we do like. Yeah, I, I wouldn't have remembered we were six. deriving with respect to time. Because mm. yeah. there was no T in the problem. That's why we're going backwards. <laughs> so then the next one is very, very, very simple. So now they give you dx dt equals s feet per second. And you want to find dy dt. And now h is generic as well. So it's 15 is to x plus y. But now it's h is to y. So you still end up with hx plus hy equals 15y. So then you have hx equals 15 minus hy. Remember, h is just a constant. So it's h, the x dt equals 15 minus h dy dt and then you'd get dy dt equals h s because s is the units for dx dt divided by 15 minus h and that's sort of like the gym generic version of this and then in the next part they might tell you numbers that go in and they would actually probably tell you hey h is 11 what is s like you would work like backwards to come up with a proportionality statement so related rates the big thing we always did was draw a picture restate the problem find out what we know make sure we watch our signs and differentiate with respect to time. So that's the big one you said you were forgetting. What do I differentiate with respect to? You differentiate with respect to time. Make sure you include units. So again, the big idea in unit four is noun, time, units, the nut factor. Water runs out of a conical tank at a constant rate of two cubic feet per minute. So I see two, I have cubic feet per minute and that it's running out. So that's dv dt equals negative two feet cubed per minute. So I'm given the rate of change of volume. The radius at the top of the tank is six. So radius is six feet. I'm really happy because the units on the volume and the units on the radius are the same. And they didn't trick me and try to give me the um, diameter. And then it says the height of the tank is 12. So now I'm imagining this radius with this height of a tank that is draining. Oh. 
How fast is the water level sinking when the water is five feet deep? So again, now I'm thinking, okay, how fast is the water level sinking? DH. One third a cylinder. So volume equals one third pi r squared h. So this is the problem in which we have to do a substitution. R equals one half h. Or exactly. H equals two r. We need a relationship between r and h. So I'm getting rid of r because I need dh dt. So r over h is equal to 6 over 12, therefore the r is equal to half the height, so we're going to replace r with 1 half h. So volume equals 1 third pi, 1 half h squared times h, or 1 third pi times one fourth h cubed, or, and this probably seems familiar now, the one twelfth pi h cubed. Yeah, it's like once you see it, you're like, yep, I remember having that. And then we're going to derive that. So dv dt equals three times one twelfth, which is one fourth pi h squared dh dt. And at this point, you just plug in what you know and solve for what you don't know. So in this case, we're solving for dh dt, which is dv dt times four divided by pi h squared. So I multiplied by my reciprocal and then divided. So you have negative two times four over pi, and then h in this case is five feet deep, so it'll be 5 squared, so you get negative 8 over 25 pi, and my units are feet per minute. So if I had to put that into words, I would say that when the water level is 5 feet deep, the tank's height is changing at a rate of negative 8 over 25 pi feet per minute. So again, can you put into words what is happening? Okay, and then that last one would be like traveling in direction. So without really reading this, and I haven't done it yet for a while, I'm thinking this is going to be a Pythagorean theorem triangle. So it says the train is traveling west. So now you need to know your compass, north, east, south, west. So the train is traveling west toward an intersection. So it's going to a meeting point um, at a speed of 100 feet per second. A car is traveling north away from an intersection. So this car is coming in this direction. That car is going away. So here's my point of intersection. There is an instant at which the train is 35 feet from the intersection and the distance between the train and the car is not changing. Find the location of the car. So again, the train is traveling west. So this is my train. The car is traveling north. So there's my car. Uh, the train's speed is a positive 100 because it's going to the point. So remember that as something is going to a point, its speed is positive. The car is going away from the intersection. 
So DC DT of a bar is negative 70 because it's going away. There's an instant at which the train is 35 feet away. So the train's distance or spot is 35. And the distance between the train and the car is not changing. So that means that this distance here, let's call it dz dt, is what? Zero. Yeah, the rate of change is zero. Except negative, it's moving north. Like, even though it's moving away, I just don't think I like it. Yeah, why is that negative? Because it's negative. Sorry? Because it's negative. Sorry, my negatives are flipped. That's negative, that's positive. The train is getting to the point, therefore its distance is decreasing. The car is moving away, therefore its, de its distance is positive. Sorry. I literally said what I wrote backwards. So, T squared plus car squared equals Z squared. Therefore, derivative is 2t dt 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 plus 2c dz dt equals 2z dz dt. What do we know happens on the right side of the equation? It's zero. Yep. But aren't we solving for z? No. What are we solving? The location of the car. Yeah, we're solving for this little baby c. So you have 2c dc dt equals negative 2t dt dt. So you can cancel the t. Yeah, divide by 2c dt. Twos are going to cancel. So it's going to be c equals the trains spot times the train's velocity divided by the car's velocity. That's why like the sign didn't really matter. It's still possible. Yeah, because it's gonna be a negative times a negative. Alright, what's 3,500 over 70? Oh, I deleted at least a zero. So it's, it's negative. It's 500. And 35 divided by seven exactly is a five. So it's neg it's positive five hundred. No. Is it fifty or five hundred? Yeah. It's fifty. Yep, so you need to go. Bye.